I'm Chuck Smith. And I'm Carol Matriciana. Welcome to this edition of The Pagan Invasion. For nearly a century and a half, evolutionary thinking has made tremendous inroads into the hearts and minds of our scientific community. This is ironic considering the fact that science defines itself as the ability to observe and test things. Yet no one has ever observed evolution taking place, and there is no conceivable way in which evolution can be tested. And as we have learned from a previous program, no hard evidence exists in the fossil record, or anywhere for that matter, to prove that evolution has ever occurred. Still, the idea that non-living chemicals changed into life and that one life form can change itself into another life form continues to be presented to the public as proven scientific fact. To promote evolution as strictly science is especially deceiving when one considers its religious roots. Evolutionary thinking has been around for thousands of years and it forms the basis of many of the world's pagan religions. While Charles Darwin is often referred to as the founder of scientific evolution, he himself was actually a theologian, having been trained in England's Cambridge University, not in science, but in theology. Darwin was also a high degree Freemason, whose religious belief was in direct opposition to biblical creation. John Dewey, along with other signers of 1933's Humanist Manifesto, were, by their own admission, members of a religious movement which they called humanism. Their militant goal was to get their religious beliefs in evolution placed in science courses, and indeed all courses, throughout America's public school systems. Today, many leading evolutionists do recognize the basic religious attributes of evolution and concede that their belief in it is, in essence, a religious one. British biologist L. Harrison Matthews writes that a belief in the theory of evolution is exactly parallel to a belief in special creation, with evolution merely a satisfactory faith on which to base our interpretation of nature. Physicist H. S. Lipson states, evolution became, in a sense, a scientific religion. Almost all scientists have accepted it, and many are prepared to bend their observations to fit in with it. Dr. Colin Patterson, senior paleontologist of the British Museum of Natural History, and who was, by all accounts, one of the world's leading evolutionists, goes so far as to say, that evolution is positively anti-knowledge. With today's cry sounding even louder for separation of church and state, we have to ask why one religious thought, evolution, is being advanced with our tax dollar in the public schools and museums, while the other perspective, special creation, is being censored. In the year 1925, schoolteacher John Scopes was on trial for presenting evolution as science. Scopes was eventually found guilty, but not before a dangerous precedent was established. For the first time in a U.S. court of law, the existence of a creator God was challenged. In July of 1925, the trial of the century took place in Dayton, Tennessee. For the first time in educational history in this land, the concept of a creator was totally challenged. This was the great turning point. Up until 1925, all of your science classes taught creation. Today, all that you have taught in the science classroom is evolutionism. John Scopes, a schoolteacher, was found guilty of violating Tennessee law, which prohibited the teaching of human evolution. Less than 10 years later, by 1933, the Humanist Manifesto was signed by a small but powerful group of people presenting themselves as a non-profit religion. Their religion was humanism, and it swept through the educational system through the zealous pursuits of John Dewey, a socialist and first president of the American Humanist Association. Today, public schools are the seminaries for Dewey's religion of humanism, and its doctrine of evolution dominates the educational system. 
Now, today we do have religion being taught in our public schools. The fundamental tenet of humanism, for instance, as listed right in the Humanist Manifesto, tenet number one, religious humanist regard to universe as self-existing, it was not created. Tenet number two, man is the product of a long natural process, that is evolution. A very few people originally got control of our education system in this land. One of the things that was imperative for them to push through their programs was evolutionism. Most people do not believe that evolution happened. The fact that most scientists do, or practically all scientists do, is in a sense neither here nor there, because in fact uh, we would like the ideas uh, to get across to our students. The thing that the average Christian in America has never realized is that his tax dollars pay the school teacher's salary, they pay for the textbooks, and yet most parents still will not say one word about anything that happens in that classroom that disturbs them. For parents to allow a godless indoctrination in evolutionism is just unthinkable. Thousands of children are bused daily to our museums as part of school-sponsored field trips where they're given crash courses in evolution. And just like in the Soviet Union, this religion of atheism is presented as fact with no alternate viewpoints allowed to be expressed. Attorney Wendell Byrd argued the case for balanced treatment of creation science and evolution before the U.S. Supreme Court. He is author of the book, The Origin of Species Revisited. To me, the basic issue is academic freedom, because no one's trying to exclude evolution from public schools while teaching a theory of creation. Instead, the evolutionists are trying to exclude alternatives while, in general, defending the exclusive teaching of evolution. Well, I think creationism should be taught in schools simply because all good ideas should be taught in schools. I think we shouldn't be afraid of ideas, whether, whether we oppose them or whether we're, we're for them. I think we should expose everyone to both sides of the issue. Eighty-six percent of the American public believes that the theory of evolution ought to be taught along with the scientific theory of creation according to an AP NBC News nationwide poll. I think creation should be taught in schools because it's, bit, it's a part of what we are in... I think it should be taught with an open mind as, without religious intonations. Lawyers nationwide, more than two to one, agree that it is constitutional to teach the theory of creation along with the theory of evolution. And lawyers better than two to one believe that both should be taught in public schools. Uh, yes, creation should be taught in uh, schools. Equal time should be given to evolution and creation. 42.3% of biology teachers believe in teaching a theory of creation along with the theory of evolution. And the same is true of school board members. Two-thirds, according to a poll by the American School Board Journal. The fact is that contrary to all of the smoke, the great majority of the American public feels that it is unfair to teach just the theory of evolution. No more than 6% have ever wanted only evolutionism taught, but there is such total domination and control in the scientific community that we still are placating the 6% of the people in this land who believe there is no God and believe that the universe created itself. Well, since there's no one answer and you can't prove the past yet, then both ideas should be taught. The only fair approach is to let the children hear all of the scientific information and make up their own minds. The founding fathers of evolution based their theories not on scientific evidence but simply on wishful thinking. The goal was to disprove the existence of God. The lack of evidence is something which has haunted evolution's devotees ever since, yet incredibly hasn't diminished its promotion. Roger Oakland, who co-authored the book The Evolution Conspiracy with me, is a former evolutionist himself and biology teacher. Recently, I asked him about evolution, its history, and its impact on education. Evolution is man's perspective on the origin, the history of the universe, and the origin and history of life. 
And really it's an attempt to explain away a supernatural explanation for the beginning of all things. So man attempts to come up with his perspective of why we're here, where we've come from in the past. Who are some of the founding fathers of this evolutionary thought? Well, first of all, I think it's important to understand that the founding fathers were not overwhelmed with facts which caused them to question the reality of a creator. There were individuals who were looking for an explanation to explain away God the Creator. They didn't want to have to rely upon a supernatural event as the beginning of all things that exist in the universe. One of the key individuals was a man by the name of Erasmus Darwin, who was actually Charles Darwin's grandfather. The interesting thing is that his views seem to be directly related to some of the Eastern mystical views. In fact, he headed up a group which he called the Lunar Society. They met once a month on the full moon, hence the name Lunar Society, and some metaphysical Eastern ideas were actually incorporated into his beliefs. And Erasmus Darwin wrote two books called the Zoonomia, in which he laid out his view on the origin and history of life, that life came into existence from non-life and then progressed and developed over time from lower levels of complexity to higher levels of complexity. Another significant founding father would be Charles Lyell. He's been called the father of uniformitarianism, or the belief that the earth is billions of years old and that the layers of the earth were laid down gradually over very long periods of time. His whole objective was to explain away the view that there had ever been a catastrophic global biblical flood in the past. And so his view was that these layers or strata were laid down gradually, uniformly over long periods, and as a result was then able to cast doubt on the authenticity of a global flood which the Bible talks about. And the major founding father of evolution would be Charles Darwin himself, who popularized the idea that life could be traced to a common ancestor, a simple form of life that then developed and progressed over long periods of time to bring about the existence of every form of life which we see in the earth today. Have today's educators actually advanced the theory of evolution in a systematic, formal agenda? I believe so, Carol. As you look back through the history of education, and specifically the last 40 or 50 years, there literally has been a program to use the public schools to advance evolution without being challenged by any alternative views on this subject of origins. And really when you, when you look at this, you see that there's some key individuals who propagated an idea back in the 1930s who actually wrote up an agenda called the Humanist Manifesto, which basic objective was to advance evolution and to question the reality that there is a creator. And some very interesting individuals were part of this organization. You've heard of John Dewey, who is called the modern father of progressive education, one of the most influential individuals in education in North America. He was a signer of this humanist manifesto, along with another gentleman by the name of Francis Potter. An interesting quote could be gleaned from a book that Francis Potter wrote in 1930 called Humanism, A New Religion. He stated, Education is thus a powerful ally of humanism. What can a theistic Sunday school meeting for an hour once a week and teaching only a fraction of the children do to stem the tide of the five-day program of humanistic teaching? So it was literally the objective of some of these individuals to use the schools to advance their belief in man, which is based on humanistic belief, which is basically a religion, and to use evolution as the means of explaining away a creator. Have teachers who promote another theory of the origin of life been suppressed or opposed in any way? That is actually a fact, Carol. As you look back over the last 10 years, there literally has been an organized agenda to advance evolution and to suppress anyone who had come up with a creationist perspective, labeling a belief in creation as religion and the belief in evolution as something which is science. Actually, in 1981, there was a meeting that was held in Washington, D.C., where the National Academy of Sciences, along with the National Association of Biology Teachers, because they were concerned that evolution was not being advanced quickly enough and that creationism was presenting itself in the schools, in the public schools, together decided that they would come up with some kind of a strategy to attack the creationist movement. And this meeting, you can read about it in a science publication, Science Volume 214, November 6th, 
1981, describes some of the people who were at the meeting and what their objectives were. And Frank Press, who was the head of the National Academy of Sciences, then was instructed that he should meet with influential people to see what they could do to stop creationism from being presented in the public schools. And it's interesting that 10 years later, in the state of California, for example, there has been an agenda to try to improve the quality of science education by allowing only evolution to be presented in the science classrooms with no mention whatsoever of an alternate view based on creation. And I'm sure you've seen some of the new curriculums, science framework, which is just put out by uh, the California Department of Education which basically states that in order to teach life science, earth science, astronomy, evolution should be a fundamental central concept of the curriculum. Evolution, which Darwin described as descent with modification, is the central organizing principle in life science. So evolution is being promoted as science, and that it shouldn't be questioned, that it is as much a fact as gravity. Roger, are there any other key individuals who have organized a campaign to discredit creationism or creationists? There are many individuals, but let me just mention a few. One of the most important individuals who has done everything he can is zealous against the creation movement is a man by the name of Isaac Asimov, of course, well-known science fiction writer. He is a signer of the Humanist Manifesto in the updated 1973 version. After the 1981 meeting in Washington, D.C., Isaac Asimov wrote an article called The Dangerous Myth of Creationism, in which he basically says that those who believe in a creationist view are dangerous to our society today because they are literally trying to push a belief in society that there is a creator, that there is a god, and they're pushing science back into the dark ages. And these individuals, like Asimov, believe that if we implement a view in our public schools, an alternative view to evolution, that our children's education is going to be destroyed. There are countless examples of individuals, qualified individuals, that have either lost positions or tenure, have been fired, simply because they're not willing to go along with the world evolutionary view in stating that the facts support evolution. They'll say that the facts don't support evolution, and as a result of that, they are removed from their positions. Let me give you a couple of examples. Forrest Mims, a well-qualified science writer with Scientific American, recently removed from his position because it was found out that he believed in a creationist perspective. Although he had not written articles from a creationist perspective, he was fired from his job. Just recently in the Capistrano Unified School District in Southern California, a public school teacher, high school teacher, because he was teaching that there were facts that didn't support evolution. He was being attacked by other biology teachers and by superintendents that, that say that he cannot continue teaching the way he's teaching because of the new science curriculum which says that evolution must be advanced without any opposition. Institute of Creation Research, of course, well known around the world for advancing a creationist view based on scientific observable evidence has come under attack by the California Board of Education claiming that they do not teach evolution properly and therefore could not be accredited as a private institution. So you can see there's all kinds of major confrontations which are occurring. Evolution is being advanced and a belief that there's a creator is being attacked and literally uh, abolished from the school system. Teaching our children to think logically and to think clearly. Isn't this the job of our educational system? Yet as the result of the exclusive teaching of evolution, students' sense of logic must be discarded. For example, if the intricately precise design of a Swiss watch is the result of a designer, what about, say, the human eye? Is it logical to assume that the eye had no designer, even though it is billions of times more intricate and precise in its design than a watch? And what about the DNA code found in each living cell? The purpose of that code is to prevent one life form from changing into another type of life form. And yet, evolution is based on the idea that life forms must change into other types of life forms. Is that logical? Students are taught evolution as fact from kindergarten through university. Scientific evidence making evolution look bad is not permitted and no opposing views on origins are allowed.
Should other concepts of how life got started be taught in the public schools? I don't think creationism should because creationism is a thinly disguised religious doctrine which has got no place in, in uh, the separation of church and state. The main issue that is always raised in opposition to teaching all the scientific evidence on the subject of origins is that it violates separation of church and state to teach evidence that doesn't happen to support evolution. People should simply be able to hear the truth. A fact is a fact. You don't throw it out just because it happens to agree with the Bible. That doesn't make it religious. Teaching a theory of creation is constitutional because the Constitution was written in the context of the Declaration of Independence, which refers to creation and even to a creator. In response to public outcry for the presentation of creation science alongside evolution, Louisiana and Arkansas were the first states to pass laws mandating balanced treatment for both theories. It was agreed that only scientific data minus religious doctrines be presented in the classrooms. The Louisiana legislature in 1981 passed a law for, quote, balanced treatment of creation science and evolution. The law also defined what evolution is, quote, scientific evidence supporting evolution. It defined what creation science is, quote, scientific evidence supporting creation. Immediately, aggressive litigation was put into action by a powerful organization which is firmly directed against traditional Judeo-Christian principles. The influential ACLU, or American Civil Liberties Union, equipped with over 500 active attorneys, invested huge amounts of money and successfully protested the law. The, one of the biggest problems you have with the ACLU is that they're so well funded. They get millions and millions of dollars from large foundations and from wealthy people all across America. That's what they did to us. They tied us up in court in Louisiana. We filed uh, a slim brief of 630 pages with 2,000 footnotes um, arguing that creation science is constitutional to teach, scientific in content, and as non-religious as evolution. The uh, U.S. District Court judge entered a summary judgment against us nonetheless, saying that creation science involves the concept of creation which implies a creator which is inherently religious. The ACLU was able to convince the Supreme Court that creation science was basically religious. The court violated the Constitution by redefining the First Amendment author's intention, which is against favoring any one religion above another. In their decision, the Supreme Court favored naturalistic evolution, a belief of religious humanists. The scientific community is very seriously worried about the growth of creationism as an attack on the uh, validity and the autonomy of science, and particularly in the insistence that creationism be taught in the public schools in science courses. There's a very strong network and general feeling that creation, theories of creation, maybe theories of abrupt appearance, are a menace to science. Let me mention several organizations that actively today try to prevent it from being taught in public schools. Committees of Correspondence, People for the American Way, the American Humanist Association, the American Civil Liberties Union, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the National Academy of Sciences, the National Education Association, the National Association of Biology Teachers, and the Biological Sciences Curriculum Study. Now, there is one anti-scientific theory today that most threatens the whole nature of scientific inquiry. It is creationism. Today we really have an organized conspiracy in this country in every state that is organized to fight the open hearing of scientific evidences on origins. The result was the forming of a loose network of active organi organizations that will cooperate to combat the creationist intrusion into the public schools, public museums, national and state parks, and the governmental funding of science research. They have a very specific desire to preserve the exclusive teaching of evolution and to exclude any teaching of a scientific theory of creation or a scientific theory of abrupt appearance. That's censorship in my view. We have today what is unquestionably the worst case of censorship. Good scientific data that happens to make it look bad for evolution, but that is meticulously censored from the textbooks. 
in an American society where we have always taken great pride in freedom of expression, freedom of religion, freedom of belief, freedom of press, it's just so unfortunate that we have such great censorship in our scientific community today. Could you talk about some of the ways that today's scientists are promoting pagan thought or metaphysical theories through evolution? I found, Carol, that there is another trend that's occurring in our society today. While creationism has been labeled religious and every effort made to remove it from the public school classroom, Eastern religion is being advanced as science and is being accepted and endorsed. They're also saying that in the future, man will take another step of evolution to a higher level of consciousness, literally advancing onwards towards a new species. So we're talking about a new dimension, an elevation of consciousness into a higher dimension, which is basically a metaphysical idea. And these ideas are being advanced by many prominent people and are literally being endorsed by many educators. This idea of an elevation to a higher level of consciousness is an ancient idea. It originated in Babel. It was a belief of the Hindus who believed that a serpent force or a psychic force would lead one on upward into a higher dimension, a higher elevation of consciousness. In this book here called Kundalini for the New Age by Gopi Krishna, the author states, I've sown the seeds of what I consider to be the most pressing need of mankind, namely information about the evolutionary mechanism in human beings slowly drawing the race to a golden future of harmony, peace, and happiness. And he says that kundalini yoga, a practice by uh, ancient Hindu practice, is something that needs to be incorporated into our society today, should be introduced by science to the, our generation to make this next step of consciousness occur in our time. So metaphysical ideas are being endorsed as science, and believe me, they are being welcomed by many educators and being advanced in the education system. What are some of the examples and ways that today's educators are bringing paganism into our schools? Well, Carol, in my office I have shelves of material and documentation that parents have brought me from various public schools of how their children are being indoctrinated with Eastern religion. But let me give you one example. Here is a book that has been used in a public school classroom in Southern California. It's entitled Meditation for Children. And the author, by her own admission in the back cover of the book, claims that she is an educational consultant for many school districts. She has taught transpersonal psychology and meditation to all age groups in the California public schools. Her books have been sponsored by superintendents of several school districts and by church leaders as effective educational tools. Then she says, much of knowledge from which we draw in learning to use meditation to get in touch with this great wisdom inside us comes from Eastern meditators, many Hindu and Buddhist. So religious ideas are being accepted in the public school classrooms and they're masquerading as science. And the author goes on to say that these techniques and these therapies are necessary in our educational system today to allow us to take another step of evolution. This is exactly the same deception, the same lie that has been repeated throughout history over and over again. Ancient pagan practices are being reincorporated into our society today and the public schools are being used to spread them and propagate them. It's apparent that evolution is playing an important role in the pagan invasion today. From your perspective, what are the reasons? Solomon, the Bible claims is one of the wisest men that ever lived, said there's nothing new under the sun. History merely repeats itself. And in the past, when man willingly removed God from his thinking and trusted in himself, the pattern was that he turned to a metaphysical, supernatural, fallen spiritual dimension. It has happened many times. And every time that that occurred, when man trusted in himself rather than God, he turned to the fallen spiritual realm. Evolution today has been the means by which God has been removed from our thinking. Evolution is literally a gateway to the gods. And this New Age belief that elevation of consciousness can attain godhood is the same belief that the ancients believed in. It began in the Garden of Eden. It was repeated at the Tower of Babel. And it occurred over and over throughout Old Testament history. Once more, history is repeating itself in our generation. 
Today, many students are not only being denied good science, they're being force-fed a pagan Hindu occult religion in its place. In giving credibility to evolution, science has moved from the realm of physics to metaphysics. I think that man is evolving into a state of higher awareness, higher consciousness, higher vibration. And I think that the best representation that we have of man's movement in that direction is what's going on in the consciousness movement, new age movement. Evolution is going on all the time. Many people believe, and I believe, that the purpose of life is to grow, and that you grow as much as you can in each lifetime. And of course, we believe in reincarnation. One prominent world religion today gaining much popularity through celebrities like Shirley MacLaine is known as the New Age Movement, or the New Consciousness Movement. At its heart is reincarnation and karma, both part of evolution which is based in Eastern mysticism. The New Age movement is asking us to recognize our oneness by accepting the idea that we all evolved from the same pond. And if we can unite our minds and spirits using techniques such as meditation and channeling, we can supposedly get incredible powers, achieve global unity. New Age is an interrelated network of various philosophies and political causes. Its goal is to promote an awareness of global oneness physically and mystically. Everybody from Jesus Christ to Adolf Hitler would be seen as someone who we can identify with because we are all one. I think that certainly there is every potential for all of us as spiritual beings to merge as one. We've mastered the evolution of the physical body. We've mastered the evolution of the mind, or we're moving in that direction. So we're coming to a time where we're using this perfected, quasi-perfected body, this opening and, and perfecting mind, to access the true perfection of the universe, which is the spiritual dimension. According to New Ages, the next phase of mankind's evolution is elevation to godhood they see the human race as a transitional form between apes and god that's i think our purpose on earth and i think we're understanding that is to make ourselves whole to become one with ourselves and then to realize our godhood and i believe that everyone has christ consciousness within themselves and all they need to do is go inside and realize that and bring it forward and be that christ consciousness Evolution, whether biological or mystical, is man's way to explain away God and his creation and put man in God's place. Man has basically got the biological future of the earth in his hands. Um, he can control evolution. We're in a time now where man is literally taking control of his own evolution, taking control of where mankind goes, both individually and collectively. I believe that the New Age movement is heading into the mainstream of American consciousness. And I think that it's going to get there by exposure in the mass media. The ideas, the concepts, the principles, the psychology, the spirituality. I think that this is a movement that will go all the way around the earth and ultimately serve as a vehicle to transform levels of consciousness that will allow us to live in a more uh, natural, harmonious way with, with the elements and with, um, with the universe. The desire for Godhood, which is the goal of the New Age Consciousness Movement, is the same thing that brought about the fall of man. In being our own gods, we can justify our behavior and are accountable to no one. In the Bible, Romans chapter 1 warns us about the natural consequences of rejecting God the Creator. It results in man becoming involved in wickedness and moral corruption. If there is a moral governor in the universe, then each person in this universe is responsible to that moral governor. The easiest thing in man's mind to do is just to dismiss the possibility of that moral governorship. Adolf Hitler used the Darwinian thesis of natural selection, the survival of the fittest, to weed out who he considered to be the inferior strand of humanity. He brutally tortured and killed 12 million people, 
6 million Jews and 6 million non-Jews. In effect, we are doing the same thing today with abortion, euthanasia and infanticide, weeding out those whom we consider to be unwanted persons. Since 1973 in the USA alone, nearly 25 million unborn human beings were killed by abortion. That is one baby every 20 seconds. If we deny that man is created in the image and likeness of God, then we lose the dignity and purpose of life. If we agree with the evolutionary premise that we are no more than evolved animals, then humankind loses all moral perspectives. We can either choose to look to evolution for the answers, or we can choose to consider an alternative. Just look at the vastness of the universe with its galaxies, solar systems, the planets, all circulating in perfect precision. There are more stars than grains of sand in all the world. Just think of the complexity of life, the intricacies of the eye, the ear, the heart, or the human brain. Is it logical to assume it all happened by random chance? Or was there an awesome creator and designer behind it all? The Bible says that man is without excuse because all around him he can see through the evidence of nature the mighty workings of a creator God. Our public school system has been described often as a zoo. And is it surprising when you teach the children that they are animals, that all of a sudden they begin to act like animals and out of control? If when a child is first able to understand or to learn anything, you begin to teach that child that two plus two equals five. And as they get into kindergarten and go on through school, they are taught two plus two equals five. That child will come to believe that two plus two equals five. And yet, that child will be destroyed from ever able to understand or to learn math. When you start with an illogical basis, it destroys you from being able to ever think logically or clearly on the subject. When you take the premise that you can have design without a designer, that is an illogical premise. But if a child is taught that from kindergarten through university, then the child will begin to believe that you can have life forms and the design in life forms without the designer but they will be destroyed from ever being able to think logically and clearly. The Bible clearly teaches that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And all the way through the Bible there is the assertion that God has created man and all of the life forms within it. That is logical because of the design that demands actually the designer and it is important that we not only see the design in creation, but you can come to know the designer himself. And that's what he intended when he designed you. Within all of us, there is a God-shaped vacuum. Throughout the ages, man has attempted to fill that void with the things of the world. But it is only through a relationship with our Creator that we can be truly satisfied. His holy scriptures reveal the way in which we can be reconciled to God, and that is through the provisions of His Son, Jesus Christ. I'm Chuck Smith. And I'm Carol Matriciana. Join us again for another edition of The Pagan Invasion.